Praise God. Say, Jesus is Lord. He is alive. I'm excited that Jesus is alive. And He's here in our midst to do mighty things. Thank you, Father God. It's a privilege to come before you, to worship you, to glorify you, to sing unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Please give me an E. Thank you. Let's give Jesus a good clap of offering. I believe when, when we come to come to church to worship Him, we should worship Him like 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 it's the only it's the last thing on earth we're gonna do. Amen. We have to give all our heart to worship and then just come and just Sunday morning again and say, Oh God, thank you. We gotta worship with all our heart. It doesn't mean that we need to shout necessarily, but our our heart must be inside. It must never be a routine. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day! Day I will never forget. After I wandered in darkness astray, Jesus, my Savior, I met. And the compassion of friend He met the need of my heart Shadows dispelling with joy I am telling He make all the darkness depart Heaven came down Heaven came down And glory fill my soul Fill my soul When the third cross the day It made me whole Behold, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When I took cross, my Savior made me whole, made my sins were washed away, and my night today. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When at the cross, my Savior made me whole, made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was done today. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Heaven came down, heaven came down and glory filled my soul, filled my soul. When at the cross my Savior made me whole, made me whole, my sins.
glory fill my soul, fill my soul. When I step cross, my Savior made me whole, made me whole. My sin was washed away. My soul, fill my soul. He gives us a good clap offering. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated. Then you did a good job. You mean? Praise God. Let's give Jesus a clap offering for the musicians. Praise God. We want to thank you for praying for us in our travels and uh, we do feel your prayers and uh, whatever God has done, uh, when you pray for us, we believe that you have a part in the reward that God has in any ministry. So we just want to thank you and say and appreciate what you have done in every way in upholding us in prayer uh, throughout our trip and it's always good to be back. Uh, we have always sensed uh, that this is where God has based us. But at the same time, to be obedient to God, we've got to reach out to places that God asks us to reach out to share the word. And uh, we praise God that we are able to share the word. Uh, we also have opportunity to meet with one of our associate pastors who is uh, uh, studying uh, in the United States and preparing to finish all his courses and come back here. Tan in Kui, some of you may know him, some of you may be new and not know him. And uh, when we met him, he's been working very hard over there and, uh, with his wife, Emily. And they send their regards uh, to each one of you here. Uh, Tan was especially excited and, uh, that, uh, and, and he said that uh, uh, God is doing wonderful things and uh, uh, he was excited to finish on the same platform as Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Sovell, Abby Cutwell. And uh, so I, I just say, well, it's the grace of God and it's just uh, the leading of God to be obedient to Him. Uh, when we were there, we shared in several churches and we were able to share in Happy Cutwell's church, one of the uh, very uh, large church there. And uh, we have good fellowship and not all the our impression of America is what the newspapers reported or what some ministers who may not be the good examples of what America should be it should be like. But we really met some really outstanding ministers with the character of Christ and the uh, humility of Christ and they took us in fellowship with them and God is doing uh, wonderful things. And some of the things that we taught over there, we have taught here about five years ago. <laughs> and uh, when we went there, we said, Lord, where shall we start? What shall we teach? And the Lord said, start from the basics. So we start from the basics. We talk about grace. And they haven't heard about grace. <laughs> uh, they heard about grace, salvation grace. But they haven't heard of ministry grace, operational grace. And, uh, and we talk about the four Greek words for power. They say, we never heard of that before. And... Uh, some of you congregation here heard about that about 10 years ago, 5 years ago. And uh, I didn't realize that God is uh, doing wonderful things in Asia and uh, some things that He's bringing forth. And uh, when I was there in America, I thank the Americans and, uh, for sending missionaries to us Asians. And uh, I encourage them by telling them that whatever they see good coming out of Asia, that the seed that they have sown in their forefathers coming here to preach the gospel to our nation, to here, uh, to Asia, uh, we Asians are thankful for that. And I realize that many other countries did send missionaries to Asia, but there's not as many as the Americans have sent. I know it was, uh, I was brought up in an American church, a Baptist church here in Malaysia, went to training, and all my professors were Americans. Uh, learn Greek from the American. They have done an impact in spite of what the world is saying about America. Uh, we owe a debt to them for bringing the gospel to us. If somebody had not been obedient to bring the gospel to us, we would not be where we are today. And uh, Although we praise God and thank God that it, we, we will not stop uh, where, from what we have learned so far from the West, 
uh, we want to press on into even deeper things and the deep, uh, greater things of God. But uh, uh, I had the opportunity to just publicly thank them for what America has done all over the world in the spiritual side. Praise God. Well, just want to thank you. And uh, that's my very, very brief report. <laughs> Let's go to God in prayer as we consider His Word. Father, we praise You and we thank You that Your mercy and Your grace continue to abound upon our lives. We are living, O oh God, in exciting times. And we know, O oh God, that Your Spirit is moving here and Your Spirit is doing wonderful things, preparing us, O oh God, for the revelation of the third wave that You're bringing to, the, to this planet Earth. We ask, O oh God, that as we study Your Word and establish ourselves in Your Word, that you would be able, O oh God, to cause our characters in our lives to be so molded that we move both in the gifts and in the Word. We move both in the Spirit and in the Word. Thank you, Father God, that you continue to cause grace to abound upon our lives. And we covenant with you, Lord, to give you all the glory, worship, and honor for all that you do. We pray for every heart here and for every mind. We pray, O oh God, that you cause them to be attentive to your word and let your word be like a two-edged sword in their hearts. Let a hammer of the word break down every barrier, O oh God, that stands against you and the will of God in their lives. Thank you, Father. We worship you. And Father God, we ask that you glorify your Son, Jesus, in our midst again. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to start a very short series on the first service. And uh, we will call it How to Deal with Criticism in Our Lives. Let's look at the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Gospel of Mark chapter 4. This morning we will deal with how to deal with criticism in how to deal with criticism and our subtopic will be offenses and persecutions. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 we have the parable of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking about the sower who went for sowing seeds. And the seed represented the Word of God. The Word was sown and scattered abroad and Jesus said that the seed fell on different types of ground. There were four classifications of ground. The first two we can classify possibly they were not even born again. There were four types of ground. Of the first two, Jesus said here in Mark chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 5, it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside and the birds of the air came and devoured it. It did not have had time to germinate. It did not have time to produce, to sprout forth, to bear roots. The birds came and ate it up. Verse 5. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched and because it had no root, it withered away. Some seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground. There were four types of ground. Then Jesus explained the parable to them in uh, verse 15 these are those who are these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown when they hear Satan comes immediately and take the word out so the word never had a chance to get into them verse 16 likewise those who are sown on stony ground when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness but look at verse 17 they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arise for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, from verse 16 and 17, some people classify the first two not to be believers. But look at the, the second one. There is a possibility that they may have been believers for some time, but they could not last. They did not have what we call enduring power. Verse 18. Now, these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire of other things, entering in choke the word. 
and the uh, last one is a good ground some, and they fall on some good ground it produces 30 fold, 60 fold, some 100 fold the first ground looks like it's not really a believer but there is a possibility that the second could be a believer who has some roots but they did not last I would like to take the second ground and go into some details in verse 17 it says they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time afterward when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake immediately they stumble the word stumble is the Greek word skandalon skandalon S-K-N-D-A-L-O-N which is where we got the English word scandal but a scandal is not just what it's talking about it's talking about a stumbling block in some of the old versions like the old King James it, and some others it says that when persecution arose for the word's sake or we could rephrase it when persecution came because of the word in other words if you get the word of God into your life you have to expect that Satan will come and challenge the word if you receive a revelation of God in any area of your life whether for healing for prosperity or for a ministry in your life if you are called to be an evangelist Satan will come and say if you are an evangelist when Jesus was the Son of God, Satan came and said, If you are the Son of God, He will come and attack you in those areas that you have got a revelation from. A revelation of God in. So here we see, see that uh, persecution arose for the word's, word's sake. says immediately, they, in the old version, it says, they were offended. They were offended because of the word of God. In fellowshipping with Carl Stringer, uh, he told me that he went ministering all over the place and he was away from home, which, which was Darwin in Australia. And uh, when he went home, he found that his house got broken into. He found that his dog was missing and, and, uh, and possibly it was eaten by, up either by a, cro a crocodile or or something and his car was gone he has been uh, his son forgot to renew some some sort of some payments or something and it was gone it was taken away and uh, everything was looks like it's a mess and he said that the first thing that happened in his heart was he was offended because he said God I've been serving you how can this thing happen and he said he was a little bit upset and angry at quote unquote what he called where were those angels of God for a moment he said he was he felt offense coming in his heart it's not just offense against a human being he felt offended at God and there are many people who feel offended at God or at people and it stumble them and they never want to go on in life they give up Christianity they give up Christian life they give up the ministry or they give up certain things that God has told them to do God gave them a rhema God gave them a logos God gave them a word but because offenses come they have no staying power they never stay long enough to see the fruit that the word of God will bring but he said God dealt with his life and he lifted his hands and said thank you God we praise you and what happened was that as he stood praising God for time God gave him the insurance gave him a new car somebody heard about his dog and they gave him a new dog and he got paid for everything and what the devil stole God was able to restore a hundredfold but he said what would have happened if he had chosen to be offended he may never get out of his situation so here it says that persecution offense will come you put the word offense or the word stumble and you begin to see what Jesus is saying 
offenses will come because of the word. Now the same thing is described in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 13. Let's look over. Matthew chapter 13, verse 21 says, He has no root in himself, but when tribulation or persecution arises, because of the word, immediately he is offended, or he stumbles, no same power. It's easy for us to get offended when criticism comes, when things doesn't work out right. We begin to look for a scapegoat. We begin to feel the emotions rising in our life that scream, give it up, let it go. But we don't realize it's one of the tricks of the enemy to cause us to let go of what God has called us to hold fast to. There's a man in the Bible, in the New Testament, whose ministry was rising high and his name was John the Baptist. Mightily used by God. God used him before Jesus Christ. He started his ministry about six months before Jesus started his. He went to the wilderness and preached and crowds came from every city to be baptized by him. In what we call the baptism of repentance. And he was drawing huge crowds. Later on, when Jesus Christ's ministry started, he was the one who, if you remember the story to save time, I'm just summarizing the story by saw in the Bible. When he saw Jesus Christ, Gospel of John, chapter 1, declares it too. He says that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he is the one who in Matthew 3 baptized Jesus in water. And Jesus did it not because he had any sin, but as an example to us. He had nothing to repent of, for he had no sin. This was the, the John the Baptist who recognized Jesus, who prophesied about Jesus. He says that uh, he is only the voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the other one who is coming greater than he. John the Baptist was the one who says when his, some of his disciples came and said, Jesus is now drawing more disciples than you. And John the Baptist says, he must decrease, uh, he must increase, but I must decrease. But John the Baptist was put in prison. And during the time that he was in imprisonment, as he was wondering what was coming for, the man who prophesied about Jesus, the man who announced about Jesus coming, the man who channeled all his disciples to Jesus Christ, now in prison, locked up by Herod, while waiting there, some things were happening in his mind. Doubts and fear may have arisen in his heart. And he called some of his few disciples that he still had. And he said to them, Go to Jesus Christ and ask him this question. Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? I'm not making this up. John actually asked that question. In the Gospels, let's look over. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 11. John was in prison by now. And he sent some of his disciples. In verse 2 and verse 3. We are in Matthew chapter 11. Verse 2 and verse 3. When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? This is John the Baptist himself. One of the greatest prophets of old. Jesus gave him the tribute of being one of the last and greatest prophets. And he asked this question. Bear in mind that he's the same one in, John, in the Gospel of John 1 
who declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God. Now he's asking, are you the Lamb of God? Or shall we look for another Lamb? Maybe he's not the one. Persecution, tribulation and hardship sometimes bring out the dark areas in our life that we didn't know were there. You didn't know that they were residing in a dark little corner in your room, in your secret chamber, until the pressure start coming. And suddenly, you see something in your own life that you never saw before. So these two disciples came to Jesus Christ and asked the same question. Our Master John the Baptist asked us to ask you, are you the one who is to come shall, or shall we look for another one? And Jesus in verse 4 said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And look at verse 6. Are you all in Matthew 11 verse 6? He has not completed his statement there. He said, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John the Baptist was close to and nearly, maybe he was even a little bit stumbled and offended at the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us who are super spiritual say, oh, oh, if Jesus were here today, and if he were to be pastoring this church or another church, or traveling in a ministry, I will never ever be offended at him. Are you sure? Do you know that Jesus in his lifetime offended some? Now I'm going to be very balanced. I'm going to show how uh, it doesn't excuse us to simply go around. Please don't take this message wrongly and go around like a proud little uh, snout and arrogant guy going around offending people. <laughs> I'll be very balanced. Please listen carefully. We, are only, we have only begun the story. The story has not ended yet. <laughs> we will cover the other section. But John the Baptist was offended. Same word. The the verb will be scandalizo. The noun is scandalon. He was offended and stumbled. And Jesus had to tell, tell the messengers of John the Baptist, go and tell John all these things they have heard and seen and tell him, blessed is he who is not offended. That must have struck like an arrow in John's heart. That must have been like a torchlight suddenly shining upon a dark area in his life. Jesus Christ had to deal with Pharisees who sometimes were offended at him too. Let's look now at the Gospel of Matthew. This time, the next two chapters, chapter 13. Now he has confronted the Pharisees and the Sadducees many times. Now he speaks to his disciples. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, we're looking at 57 here. He says here, So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and his own house. These were Jesus' own home folks. And when Jesus returned to his hometown, a lot of the people didn't know him when he was a little boy. They knew him when he was a carpenter. It tells us here in verse 55, Is this not the carpenter's son? Do we not know his mother? Do we not know his sisters? Do we not know his brothers? And they were offended at him. And when you're offended, you criticize. A lot of people who criticize say it's constructive criticism, but they forget Matthew 7 verse 1. Judge not and you shall not be judged. 
Next week, we will teach on how to correct constructively. But we want to teach on what a blessing it is not to be offended and learning not to be offended. Because many people who criticize, criticize out of a, a spirit of being offended. That's not correction. That is attacking another person. Correction is from a spirit of meekness and respect. Remember this, if you don't respect somebody, you can never correct them. It's important for us to see that Jesus did offend some in his ministry and life. And uh, in fact, in Matthew 15, just, just two more chapters down the line, Matthew 15, in verse 1, he had a confrontation with the scribes and Pharisees. Now this is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the fairest of 10,000, the lily of the valleys, the bright and morning star. And he comes and, and says the Pharisees, and the Pharisees says, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And then verse 3, Jesus answered them back, Why do you transgress the commandment of God? Now I will call that a confrontation. And we look at verse 7, Jesus said, Hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Then he called the multitude and said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what goes out of the mouth that, def- that de- this defiles a man. Then was sure, his disciples were already afraid. They, they were scared at the way Jesus Jesus confronted the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees because in those days you don't confront the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They are the authorities at large. They were the religious authorities. And here was Jesus Christ talking without fear. And the disciples came to Jesus in verse 12 and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended at you? They were saying, Jesus, you have offended them. Now Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. He's without sin. And you say, how can a perfect life And is it possible to live a life where you don't offend anybody in this world? You can only be like the Master. You cannot be greater than the Master. If Jesus found it impossible not to walk without offending some, you will never reach that point. The reason we need this teaching is because we need to be balanced. For there are different characters of human beings. On one side is a part of our character that likes to please people and not offend people. On the other part of our character is a part that really wants to do something and, and not just follow the majority, but really to do what you know and you are convicted in your heart, whether you are, you are a minority or, or whether everybody is with you or everybody is not with you, you have a conscience and you want to obey it. So we need to blend the two perfectly. Yet at the same time, we realize that we realize that there are many Christians out there, and sometimes there are also many ministers out, out there. Some who have left the ministry. And you ask them, why are they out of the ministry? They were offended by people. They give it up. Or you ask some some Christians who no longer attend church. You ask them, oh, what are they doing now? It's because they, they are offended by some people. And Jesus said, Blessed are those who, are, who don't take offense, who are not offended. So how shall we deal with that? You see, criticism can make you offended. You could succumb under the pressure and give up and make a wrong decision in your life. Or maybe you're the one bringing it forth because you have been offended. On both ends, there's a lot of hurt going on. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 18, let's look, verse 19. 
which is why we need to tread carefully on this ground. Proverbs 18, verse 19. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Contentions are like the bars of a castle. It says that a brother who has been offended is harder to win than a strong city. In other words, it's easier to go and conquer a city than to win back that brother who has been offended. So when, when we walk in the Spirit of God, and as we understand that we are not talking about a new word, we are talking about the same word skandalizo as a verb or skandalon as a noun, the same word where the Gospel of Mark chapter 4 tells us that persecutions will arise because of the word and they were offended. Persecutions produces offenses and it depends on how you react and how you handle an opportunity to be offended. Either to be offended or to offend. That is part of what persecution is. Persecution is not suffering sickness or disease or something that is out of God's will. Persecution is when you're confronted with an opportunity and it says here, because of the word in the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Say after me. Say that tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake. See, persecution will arise for the word's sake. And I put it in the positive sense and say, Blessed are those who are not offended. See, here in Mark 4, verse 17, if the reason these people cannot last and they cannot bear fruit is because they were offended, then taking the opposite, if we could prevent ourselves from being offended, if we could stop ourselves from being offended, then the Word would have life in us. Look at it in a positive sense. In Mark 4, verse 17, it says, uh, let's put it positively afterward. When tribulation or persecution arises for the work's sake, immediately they were not offended, then it will mean that they will go down to the fourth ground. They are good ground. The world will have will bear fruit in their life. The world will bring marvelous things in their life. So we have to guard our heart against being offended. We have to learn the secret of how to handle criticism. And how not to give offense where it's unnecessary. What causes offenses to come? Why does it happen? I'll give you four reasons. Number one, different expectations. When there are different expectations, there is always a possibility of offenses coming. Perhaps your father expected to do something but you see something else that you want to do. What happens? You're offended, your father is offended. Perhaps you're put in a position of leadership where, where the, the people expect you to do something, but you see something, you do, do something. There are two different expectations. Offense will come. Blessed are those who are not offended. When different expectations are there, there will be a chance and opportunity of being offended and we must be aware of that. You could replace the word offense with criticism. Because criticism is a modern word for offenses. And they will always be there. We must learn to handle it. It does not mean that you have to be out there ministering to thousands of people to receive offenses and criticism. No, you could just be a little humble Christian ministering privately to one or two persons and you will have an opportunity to be offended too. Everybody in this life, every Christian, will have the word tested in their life. Tribulation and persecution will come because of the word. Not because you're ministering the thousands. Not because you're a public figure. Not because you're a private or public figure. But it's because the word comes into your life. When the word comes, you have to be prepared. There will be an opportunity to be offended or for others to be offended for you. You have to learn how to handle it. Different expectations will come. And they are there. Let's look at a gospel story here in uh, Matthew chapter 26. Jesus here speaks to his disciples in verse 31. 
Then Jesus said to them, Matthew 26, verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you shall be made to stumble, and that's the word to be offended, because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble or to be offended because of you, I will never, I will never be made to stumble. Peter thinks that he will never be made to stumble. But he did. He denied Jesus Christ. He cursed when the name of Jesus was mentioned to him and he was associated with Jesus Christ. And Jesus says all, and talking about his disciples, all of them had an opportunity to be stumbled. They had to learn how to deal with that. Why would they stumble? Jesus Christ came as the suffering Messiah. It was a revelation to know that the Messiah was not going to establish the kingdom of Israel. Up to Acts chapter 1, they were still thinking of the kingdom of Israel being established. But Jesus did not do it. Jesus came to take the sins of the world. Jesus' objective was different from theirs. When there are different expectations, there is a ground there for offenses to come. Second reason, when there are different levels of knowledge. When there are different levels of knowledge, the difference between the knowledge will be ground for offense. In the book of Corinthians, chapter 8, verse 13, First Corinthians chapter 8 verse 13 Paul is speaking about different levels of knowledge the strong Christian and the weak Christian and so he says here in verse 11 and because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died but when you does sin against the brother and wound your weak conscience you sin against Christ Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul says that there is a, those with knowledge who know what can be done, what cannot be done. And then those who have lesser knowledge who only know what cannot be done. And the context is about idle food. Basically, he says there's no, no, no harm, nothing wrong. It will not cause you to be demon possessed. He says, whatever is sold in the market, just keep asking no questions. It will not bring a demon into your life. He says, because God is above all and over all. But there are some who don't have the knowledge and revelation. He himself calls that brother the weaker brother. And he says that, that the one who has knowledge who does it may offend the one who does not have the knowledge. So different levels of knowledge will be a potential ground for offense to come. Because of the amount, a varying amount of knowledge that is always there. For every single one of us are at different levels in our Christian life. And we have a different, different depth in the Word. We have a different depth in the Spirit. We have a different depth of relationship with God. Therefore, if we all do things differently, of course you will be offended to a certain extent here, one to another. We have to learn how not to be offended. Perhaps we could be on the weaker brother. And if we are the weaker brother and we see somebody who has knowledge doing some things that our own faith cannot reach to, let's not be offended. Let's say, thank God, I, want, I don't want to be like, like Cain who ended up murdering Abel, but I want to be uh, 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 teachable and learn from that person's faith. Let's not be offended, but, but let's learn that person's knowledge. And if we are on the stronger side, what, as we work out our knowledge, we have to be sensitive to whether it offends some people or not. We have to be sensitive to that. 
Paul says he wants to he wants to give room for the weaker one. Which is why if you have your faith level and, and you want to drive, you know, whatever car you want, and you have your faith level, go. I mean, you go ahead. I mean, it's your faith level. But at the same time, if you you got the faith for all those kinds of things, and as you make your decision, you got to be aware of whether you will cause a lot of stumbling so that people will not be able to see Christ in your life. See, there's always potential ground. There are potential grounds for differences. The way you bring out your children on your knowledge and principles may be different from another person. There will be principles that are similar, but there will be differences. Don't criticize. Don't get offended. Look for the end result. See, the end result is the most important thing. You may agree or disagree with a person, but remember, the question is the fruit. Does it bring forth the fruit? That's the, the key. And in the meanwhile, if we got offended along the way, we are not going... We are, we are not... The, the person we are offended is not going to lose. The one who gets offended is the one who loses. Because of offenses, the word stop working in your life. The word stop bearing fruit in your life. And in the end, you, get, you are the loser. We have to guard our hearts against being offended. That's reason number two. Different levels of knowledge will be a potential ground for offenses and criticism to come. As long as you're aware of it, when it comes, you can leave your hand and say, Bless God, I'm not going to be offended. But has God tell you to do something, something weird to other people? But has God told you in your heart, in your own heart, you know that God, God tells you, you're going to win 1,000 people to Christ to tell somebody they laugh at you. Maybe you really have a revelation of God. Maybe God came in a dream and a vision and told you that. And you are like Joseph. But all your brothers laugh at you. Indeed, shall that happen? Now, the brothers may be offended at you. But the other thing is, you also may be offended at them. And if you allow offense to come, you will stop the word from working in your life. The word will stop working because you're offended. Guard our hearts against offenses. Take persecution and tribulation will arise for the word's sake. Blessed are those who are not offended. The third area where, uh, where potential offenses can come is what we call in the area of uh, differing principles. Now it's slightly different in the area of uh, uh, differing principles and methods. Put it this way. We have, to, we have to understand that principles don't change, but methods change. You could take one principle and apply it in four or five different methods. And we need to understand that methods can be contextualized and changed and adapted. But principles, if you compromise it, you lose your entire integrity. I mean, if the whole world wants to, wants to commit sin and you say, I don't want to, you be the odd one out. So the third principle is, when do we compromise so that we are not going to offend anyone and when do we take a stand not to compromise see the Bible is balanced here the Bible tells us do your best not to offend people the Bible does say that at the same time there are some things that you can't avoid it will offend some if you go about praying in tongues, a lot of time, 24 hours a time, and even if you're driving and your people are talking, your mouth is moving. People are going to be offended. Why must you move your mouth? Why can't you pray in tongues with the tongue moving and the lips closed? People will be offended because they don't understand the way you bring up the principles of God in your life. And are you going to compromise by saying, therefore I'm not going to pray in tongues anymore? then you will be losing because you got offended. Blessed are those who are not offended. Let's look at the other picture of when we should learn not to give offense. Let's look at this other picture here. 
so that we have a balanced area. First Corinthians chapter 10, First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Paul says, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Now he's saying here, do your best not to give offense. Keep the principles, but you can adapt the methods in ways that it will not offend people. So the third point talks about differing principles, differing methods, and uh, let's get a few more scriptures out. Acts 24, verse 16. And here is where the balance needs to come in. Acts 24, verse 16. Paul, in his testimony, made this statement. He says, This being so, I myself always try to have a conscience without offense toward God and man. Now, I want you to see what he's saying here. He's talking about both principles and methods. If you remove the word conscience out, you become a spineless jellyfish. Paul says he wants to live his life based on his conscience without offense. He doesn't want to live his life just trying not to offend anybody. You see the difference? Sometimes you try not to offend people, you end up going against your own conscience, you are going to be in trouble. Oh, everybody is offended because you are a Christian going to church. Everybody is laughing at you for going to church regularly and reading the Bible every lunch hour. And you are going to say, hey, I don't want to offend them. Let me read the, the Bible in the bathroom. your conscience will bother you because the non-Christians can read all their filthy things in public but you don't dare to read your Bible in public. God is going to deal with your life and say you're a cowardly, fearful Christian and your conscience is going to bother you. You have compromised even your conscience and not just your method. Method can be compromised but conscience can never. See, you cannot compromise principles that line up with the conscience. But you can. And Paul says he strives, he strives in his heart not just not to offend people. He did not say, I strive not to offend people. That would be a wrong statement, a misstatement. What he's saying is, I strive with my conscience not to offend people. And Paul himself admits when we look at the fourth point, you see in Galatians, Paul admits that as long as you love Jesus, there will be some points in your life that do offend people. Paul says in Galatians, if I don't preach the cross, I will not offend the Jews anymore. And Paul says, if I have not been preaching the cross, why then is this persecution coming? He's saying that if he stop preaching the cross, some people today are so modern in Christianity, modern liberal theology, they don't believe in the blood of Jesus anymore. They think it's barbaric to think about the blood of Jesus. And when you talk about the blood, they get offended. Some people who are against the Holy Spirit and they cannot just hear any mention about charismatic or about things of the Spirit, they get offended. Are you going to stop and not mention it? The basis is our physical body as an example. Our physical bodies were beautifully constructed by God and we have bones in our body. We have tissues and muscles in our body. Without the bones, bones have to be solid and strong to hold up the muscles and the tendons. But the muscles must be flexible enough for free movement. If all you have are bones, you are dead and dry. If all you have are muscles and no bones, you will be a blob in the ground. And you will not walk to church, you will slide into church. God is so marvelous. He wants us to have a physical body that has a bone, a solidness, and yet a softness with muscle tissue. In life, to be a success, you have to have these two qualities married in you. you. We have to have a quality where we are like a man or woman of steel. 
When you make a quality decision based on God and on your conscience, you can think, I shall not, I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water side, I shall not be moved. That quality is necessary to be a success. Why? Because in life, success comes by swimming upstream. Failure comes by doing nothing. All you have to do in life to fail is do nothing. So we have to have a certain quality of steel and diamond inside us. At the same time, we have to have a quality of gentleness in us. You have to have the bones and the muscles. A quality of gentleness so that as you are going forth to the goal and vision of your life, you are considering of others who may not be at your level or who may not understand you. You don't just kick people out of the way. You politely say, excuse me. There has to be a gentleness that is on your life. The two qualities must be married in your life to be the human being lightened unto the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to have the other part where you are gentle like a lamb, meek as a, as a dove, gentle and innocent, the quality in your place. In the Gospel of John, uh, let's look now at uh, Philippians 1 verse 10. I'll leave the John one out till later. Philippians 1 verse 10. That you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere, and that word sincere usually relates to the conscience, and without offense to the day of Christ. Paul prayed for the Corinthians. He said, I pray that you will never be offended, nor give offense in your life as you grow. Say tribulation and persecution will arise for the word's sake. Blessed are those who are not offended. Now the fourth point is what we're going to close on. The third point we have stressed that there are some things that you could do so that you don't offend people. Paul says, give no offense to Greek or Jew. By all means, give no offense. Do your best in those areas. As long as it doesn't violate your conscience. No problem. Now, in the fourth point, we see the other picture. In Matthew chapter 24, a prophecy about the last day. Matthew 24. Verse 9, verse 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulations and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now that's not going to be easy to take. Now some of you may not be chosen to be martyrs, you may not have the word kill applied to you or martyrs, but then the other part may apply to you, you will be hated by all nations. There is a quality in our human psyche where we feel uncomfortable if some people don't like us. We want everybody to like us because we want to be loved. We don't want to be hated. Nobody wants to be hated. Nobody chooses to be hated. But Jesus says in the last days, as the body of Christ grows brighter and brighter into righteousness and holiness, and as the world grows darker and darker, there may be some sufferings or tribulations or persecutions or hardship that you go through. And when you're going through that, brethren, oh Christians, oh brothers and sisters in Christ, when you're going through those hardships, because of the word, don't get offended. Don't question God. Don't blame somebody. Understand that they will need to come because of the word. They are only for a season if you pass the test. I have seen many people fail that test. Sometimes I see a fellow minister in God and I could see them getting their rightful portion of criticism. As you grow in life, at each portion, you will get a portion of criticism that comes. That will test you to see whether you get offended. 
I will see some of them puffing up. We know that ministers are likened to an ox. When I came back to the office, the first thing I saw on my desk was a little picture of this cow. And the staff said, you know, the ministers are like an ox. So they put a picture right on my desk. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> Welcome back, cow. Ox. The only thing I couldn't understand why they put a female cow. <laughs> And you could tell that it was a female cow because you could see that uh, the portion where the cow gives the milk are still there. <laughs> and sometimes a minister who is like an ox and cow, they behave like a cow or ox in the wrong way. What do they do? They become like these Spanish bulls. When, when criticism comes, I mean the, the cloud goes up, their face turns red, and they charge like a bull. They don't know that it's a devil's game in their life. They get offended and their ministry stops. The word stops working in their life. Say blessed are those who are not offended. So if you want a blessing, hold fast to the fact that you choose never to be offended. The next time criticism comes, remember this word and say, Blessed are those who are not offended. I'm not going to be offended. I'm just going to follow my conscience, bless God, and pray for my enemies. It says in Matthew 24, Jesus says, All this hardship is going to come. And He says there in verse 10, And then many will be offended. Many are going to be offended because they're going to ask, Why, God, must this happen? Why must these things happen? And they're going to get angry at God. They're going to get angry at the church institution. They're going to get angry at anything they can get angry with. And it says, They will betray one another and they will hate one another. I want you to know that offense comes first then betrayal and then hate. It's one step leading to another. You see, some people, as you encounter some people, you cannot understand how can that wonderful, sweet Christian end up in such a state of hate? We don't understand because Christianity is loving others as Christ loved you. And sometimes when you meet Christians who have been offended, Christians behaving like non-Christians. And I want you to know that the people who give the most trouble in the Christendom are not unbelievers. They are Christians who have been offended. And we need to know how to win them to the Lord. Win them with the love of God. And sometimes when you fellowship, you don't understand. How can a Christian be filled with such hate? You know why? It is a progression. You are first offended. Secondly, you begin to distance yourself. A brother who is offended is harder to win than, than a city. Before long you reach a third level where hate does come in. Bitterness. The first is offense. Second, bitterness comes. Thirdly, hate develops from bitterness. That's why the book of Hebrews says, God, don't allow the root of bitterness to grow in you. Because when we allow that, the word cannot grow in our life. So learn that here and there, there will be opportunity. I mean, I fellowship with, uh, with men of God here and there, and uh, there was one famous man of God that we dropped by to see, and I had the opportunity to be offended. Why? Because I had taken care of that man of God. I welcomed him, taken him out for, uh, and fellowship with him, welcomed him here into this church. But when I visited that man, he wouldn't want to see me. I mean, I was not a stranger. I welcome him. I had opportunity to be offended. But I said, thank God, I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to run down his ministry from that day forward. I'm not. I'm just going to say, thank God, he's still winning so. But I'll know at what distance now to work with that man. We can get offended by all kinds of things. You could get offended by the, how, how somebody wear their clothes. How somebody wear their shoes, how somebody talk, how somebody act. You could get offended for everything under the sun. Let's learn how not to get offended so that the word can grow in our life. Here we have 
the gospel <coughs> of Matthew chapter 18 verse 7 to show that principle 4 has to go with principle 3 principle 3 is talking about how we could adapt our method so that we don't offend give no offense as much as possible but principle 4 is also telling you you got to face life as it is because in Matthew 18 verse 7 Jesus says woe to the world because of offenses and look at what he said for offenses must come must come but woe to that man by whom the offense comes it tells us that definitely it will come it's a portion of this life in Luke 17 verse 1 very quickly Luke 17 verse 1 then he said to the disciples to his disciples it is impossible impossible he says that that no offenses should come Woe to them through whom they do come. Don't allow yourself to be an instrument of offense. Because blessed are those who are not offended and it says woe to those through whom the offense comes. The words of Jesus Christ. Romans 9 verse 33. Verse 23. 33, that's right. As it is written... Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. You know what they call Jesus? They call Jesus the rock of offense. A stone that will offend some and that will cause some to love him. Jesus did say at the end of John chapter 16, the last verse, he did tell us, In the world you shall receive tribulation. All who live godly will receive persecution. And they come not because of who you are. They come because you have got the new revelation of the word. Every new revelation of the word you have, you will be challenged and offenses will come. Guard your heart against offenses so that the word of God can be reached in your life. Say, blessed are those who are not offended. Persecutions and tribulations Welcome because of the word of God. But blessed are those who are not offended. I choose not to be offended. I choose to handle criticism correctly. I choose to be mature. To be a man and or woman of steel. And with the meekness and gentleness of a lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we pray that you cause an understanding to come upon our hearts and lives. That as long as the word is in our lives, there will be opportunities to be stumbled, to be offended. And we pray, O oh God, that the word that comes into our lives will have a free cause to grow. Cause us, O oh Lord, to be free of offenses. O oh God, cause us to repent of our offenses. So that we could look at the real value of what you're trying to do in our lives. To allow your word to be strong. We pray that you free each one of us from offenses, O oh Lord. And those under the sound of my voice. And if there be any, O oh God, who hear this word, as this word goes around the world, if they hear this word, and they know that they are where they are today in the imperfect permissive will of God because of offenses we pray that you set them free and get them back into the perfect will of God Father God that your word will once again bear fruit a hundredfold in their lives thank you for your grace and your mercy Lord in Jesus name Amen let's arise together let's sing that song blessed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. We should be 
in his blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. As you sing that song again, if you are here right now and you know that your, the Word has stopped working in your life, it really has stopped working in your life, and you, you feel like you're just on a plateau, you're not progressing in your Christian life anymore, because somewhere along the line you have been offended, or you have offended and you know you need to be free from that and you come right up or perhaps you are going through a heavy time of criticism and hardship and now you understand that it's because of the word's sake not because of you and you need that grace of God to come into your life that you could go through all the way with your lips sealed with your hands raised just praising God and we want to pray with you right now this is my story, this is my song, my Savior all the day long. This is my story, in our midst today, in our midst today uh, is a young man who has been in the ministry before. You are no more in the ministry because you have been offended. I want you to know that the call and the gifts of God are without repentance. The call is still on your life. If you get back to God, that gift of God will come and you'll get back to the ministry of God. He'll open a way for you right now. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Those of you who need to go, you may go. We're going to pray for this right now. Close your eyes and lift up your hands to the Lord right now. We thank you, Father God. Your grace and your mercy will be upon their lives, O oh God. And cause you fresh grace to be upon their lives. Lord, let them let go of those things that have offended them, Lord. So that their Christian life can grow in you, Lord. That they want you going round and round in the wilderness, O oh Lord, and going nowhere. Walking a lot, sweating a lot, and toiling a lot, but going nowhere, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that you set them free and cause them, O oh God, to be able to move upwards towards you to higher ground, Lord. Thank you, Father God. Lay your grace and your mercy, Lord, be upon their lives. In Jesus' name we thank you, Lord, for setting them on a higher plane. Higher plane, Lord, in you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives, Lord. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. In Jesus' name. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. Thank you, Lord. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. Thank you, Jesus. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. Thank you, Jesus. Your grace and your blessings, Lord. On your lives. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Grace in your blessing on your life. Thank you, Jesus. 
This is my story. This is my song. Lord, let your grace and your blessings flow. Abound the fresh Lord into your life. We are all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praise my Savior all the day. Lord, your grace and your mercy, Lord, established upon us.